This is video podcast 30 from learningradiology.com. Diseases of the Great Vessels. Hello, I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. In general, aortic anomalies are usually asymptomatic unless they cause an encircling vascular ring like a pulmonary sling or a double aortic arch. They can be complex lesions and they frequently require multiple projections using MR or CT. Just as a reminder, this is the normal branching of a left aortic arch. The first branch is the right brachiocephalic artery. The second major branch is the left common carotid artery. And the third branch is the left subclavian artery. Left aortic arch with anomalous right subclavian artery. This is a rare abnormality occurring in less than 1% of all people. The right subclavian artery arises as the last branch of the aortic arch and passes posterior to both the esophagus and the trachea. It produces an oblique shadow above the aortic knob that can be seen on the frontal chest radiograph. And the origin of the right subclavian artery can be dilated. That's called the diverticulum of Coumarel. The branching for a left aortic arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery The first branch is the right common carotid artery. The second branch is the left common carotid artery. The third branch is the left subclavian artery. And then the last branch of the aortic arch is the aberrant right subclavian artery that passes behind both the trachea and the esophagus. Schematically, the aberrant right subclavian artery passes posterior to both the esophagus, which is shown in green in these diagrams, and the trachea in blue. I don't wish to imply by the sharp angles of this defect that this produces an intraluminal defect in the esophagus. It's an extrinsic compression. And this is what a left aortic arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery can look like. On a frontal chest examination, the red arrow is pointing to the oblique shadow, just superior to the aortic knob. On the lateral view, the trachea and esophagus will be displaced forward. This is a CT scan of a left aortic arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery. The red arrow is pointing to the left aortic arch. And in this CT, you can see the aberrant right subclavian artery passing posterior to the air in the trachea and pushing it forward. Right aortic arches. Right aortic arches come in at least five different types, but only two are of major importance. And those two are a mirror image type, which is also called a type 1, and the right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery, which is a type 2. All right aortic arches have certain things in common. The aortic knob is on the right side. There is leftward displacement of the trachea. There is no aortic knob on the left side. The aorta descends on the right. And usually just above the diaphragm, the aorta returns to the midline and then to the left side. In general, the mirror image type of right aortic arch is almost always associated with congenital heart disease, usually tetralogy of fellow. The right aortic arches with an aberrant left subclavian artery are rarely associated with congenital heart disease, and they are also the most common variety of right aortic arches. The type 1, or mirror image type, is associated with congenital heart disease 98% of the time. Its embryological origin is secondary to interruption of the left arch just distal to the ductus arteriosus. And this is what the branching of a mirror image right aortic arch looks like. First, here's the normal arch, right brachiocephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery as its three major branches. A right arch with mirror image branching, the first branch off of the arch is the left brachiocephalic artery. The second is the right common carotid artery. The third is the right subclavian artery. There is no posterior impression on the trachea or the barium-filled esophagus by a mirror image aortic arch. The heart is usually abnormal in size or shape because of the presence of congenital heart disease, and the aorta descends on the right. This is an example of a mirror image right aortic arch in a patient with Tetralogy of Fallot. This is an adult. 
You can see that the arch is on the right side and displaces both the barium filled esophagus and the air in the trachea toward the left. You can see that the heart has an abnormal shape to it produced by elevation of the apex of the heart by right ventricular hypertrophy. And on the lateral view, the green arrow is demonstrating that there is no forward displacement of either the barium filled esophagus or air in the trachea. Here is a series of CT images in another patient with a mirror image right aortic arch. You can see that the aortic arch is on the right side and that there is no vessel that passes posterior to the air in the trachea or the esophagus. A right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian is associated with cardiac defects about 5 to 10 percent of the time. Most commonly it too is tetralogy of Fallot then atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect, and coarctation of the aorta rarely. The branching of a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery, the first branch is the left common carotid artery, the second branch is the right common carotid artery, the third branch is the right subclavian artery, and then the aberrant left subclavian arises as the last branch off of the right arch and passes posterior to both the trachea and the esophagus. This is a diagram that demonstrates the posterior position of the aberrant left subclavian artery behind both the trachea and the esophagus. There will be a posterior impression on the trachea and the barium filled esophagus in patients who have an aberrant left subclavian. The heart will usually be normal in size and shape because most of these patients have no congenital heart disease. The aorta descends on the right. This is an example of a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian. The red arrow is pointing to the right sided aortic arch, which is displacing the trachea to the left. And on the lateral view, the green arrow here is pointing to the forward displacement of the air in the trachea produced by the aberrant left subclavian artery. This is a CT example of a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery. You can see that the arch is on the right side and that there is a vessel that insinuates itself behind the trachea and the esophagus, which is the aberrant left subclavian artery passing toward the left side of the body. If a patient has a mirror image right aortic arch, then it will be associated 90% of the time with tetralogy of Fallot, 6% of the time with truncus arteriosus, 5% with tricuspid atresia. If a patient has one of these diseases, then there will be this percent that have a mirror image arch. If a patient has truncus arteriosus, there is a 33% chance that it will be associated with a mirror image right aortic arch. If they have tetralogy of Fallot, a 25% chance. And transposition of the great vessels, a 10% chance. Tricuspid atresia, 5% chance. So that more patients with a mirror image right aortic arch have tetralogy of Fallot than any other congenital heart disease, but more patients with truncus arteriosus have an associated mirror image right aortic arch than with any other congenital heart disease. And the discrepancy between the two statements comes about because there's a much higher incidence of tetralogy of Fallot than truncus arteriosus. Double aortic arches. In general, a double aortic arch is the most common vascular ring it is rarely associated with congenital heart disease, but the vascular ring produces tracheal and or esophageal compression. It's caused by persistence of the right and left fourth branchial arches. The double aortic arch passes on both sides of the trachea and join posteriorly behind the esophagus. The right arch is usually larger and higher than the left, which is smaller and lower. A barium swallow will show bilateral impressions on the barium filled esophagus on the frontal view and a posterior impression on the lateral view. An angiogram is characteristic. Symptoms from a double aortic arch may begin at birth. The symptoms include tracheal compression or difficulty swallowing. This is a diagram of a double aortic arch 
The right-sided arch usually gives rise to the right subclavian artery and right common carotid artery, the left arch to the left subclavian artery, and the left common carotid artery. A double aortic arch produces a posterior impression on the esophagus and an anterior impression on the trachea. As we said, the right arch is usually higher and larger than the left. This produces an S sign that's reversed on the esophagram in the AP projection. On the lateral view, the arches are posterior to the esophagus and anterior to the trachea. This is an example of a kitty with a double aortic arch. You can see that there is a larger right impression, higher than the smaller left impression produced by the two arches on the frontal view. And then on the lateral view, there is a posterior impression followed by an anterior impression shown by the red arrow. Double aortic arch has a characteristic angiogram, which is shown here with the branching as indicated. Cervical aortic arches. In general, they're quite rare. They're usually asymptomatic. They can present as a pulsating supraclavicular mass, or they can produce a vascular ring and compress the airway. Their embryogenesis is uncertain. Most cervical aortic arches are right-sided. Right-sided cervical aortic arches produce an apical mass. There will be absence of the aortic knob on the left. The aorta descends on the left, and there is displacement of the trachea and esophagus forward. Branching can be normal, or it can be mirror image. In left-sided aortic arches, the aortic knob is at the apex of the left lung. These also descend on the left, but they do not displace the trachea or esophagus forward. This is an example of a cervical aortic arch in an adult. You can see this soft tissue density, which represents the aortic arch high in the apex of the lung. This happens to be a left cervical arch. Most of them are right-sided. And this is the CT scan of that same patient that shows the cervical aortic arch high in the apex of the left lung. Pulmonary slings. Pulmonary slings occur as a result of an aberrant origin of the left pulmonary artery from the right pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery passes between the trachea and the esophagus, and most of these are associated with other anomalies. For example, stenosis of the right mainstem bronchus that can lead to air trapping, low bar emphysema, and a hyperlucent lung. This is a diagram of a pulmonary sling that shows the left pulmonary artery arising from the right pulmonary artery and passing between the trachea and the esophagus. And this is an example of a pulmonary sling. On the lateral view, we can see that there is an anterior compression on the barium-filled esophagus and a posterior impression on the air-filled trachea. There is something in between the trachea and the esophagus. Tracheal impressions. A posterior impression on the esophagus, you should think of a left aortic arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery or a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery. An anterior impression on the trachea is rare. There are multiple isolated anomalies that are relatively uncommon. An impression on the anterior trachea and posterior esophagus, you should think of a double aortic arch. An impression between the trachea and the esophagus, you should think of a pulmonary sling. Here is your mini quiz. This is an adult. You have a frontal and lateral chest x-ray. Pause your computer or MP3 player and decide what you think. Well, if you said that this is a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery, you'd be correct. This image shows the right aortic arch displacing the air-filled trachea to the left and the lateral image demonstrates forward displacement of the air-filled trachea, indicating that there is an aberrant vessel behind.